there's an old Latin proverb, premonitus premonitus. In English, forewarned is forearmed, which simply means knowing something in advance gives you time to prepare. That is Daniel chapter 8 in a nutshell. God gives his people a peek into the future so that they know what is coming. Empires will rise and fall. World rulers will dominate and disappear. Persecution will elevate and escalate for the people of God. What's coming is going to be rough. It's going to be tough. And God's people need to brace themselves so that they may trust their God no matter what. But God will see them through to the end. His kingdom will prevail. And that was the message that God's people needed to hear in Daniel's day and beyond. And it is certainly the message that God's people need to hear today. There will be dark days ahead. Global politics will be turbulent and impermanent. Nations will be ferocious and fragile. Opposition against Christian will be brutal and unfair. But no matter what, God will be at the helm. God will guide history to its intended end. God will accomplish his purpose and exalt his name. And God will care for his people along every single step of the way, even though the way be painful. With that said, if you're not already there, please join me in Daniel chapter 8. The vision we have before us is remarkable in its clarity, its power, and its message to us today, long after Daniel received it. We're going to approach our time in two parts. First, we're going to ask and answer the question, what does it mean? What is God seeking to communicate to his people through the words of Daniel chapter 8? And second, we're going to ask and answer the question, what do I do? How am I personally supposed to respond to the revelation of God in Daniel 8? How am I meant to prepare myself for what lies ahead in the future? Well, let's begin with our first question, what does it mean? And to answer that, we're going to walk through Daniel's vision and we're going to unfold the prophecy bit by bit. Let's start in verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. Well, a couple things I want you to notice. One, it's 551 BC. It's the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, so Babylon is still in power. Medo-Persia has not yet assumed world domination. And this is actually two years after the vision of chapter 7. So Daniel is about 69 or 70 years old. Second thing I want you to know is beginning here in 8.1, the language of Daniel shifts from Aramaic to Hebrew. So in the prior portions of Daniel, excluding chapter 1, it was all in Aramaic because the focus was on global affairs, on foreign empires. So the language is Aramaic. However, there is a pivot in chapter 8-1, and the spotlight will shift from global empires to God's people. And then the language that will therefore revert back to Hebrew, because that's the language of God's people. Now, still in verse 1, notice at the end that it says, after that which appeared to me at first. And he's saying, this vision is subsequent to the vision I had in chapter 7. And if you remember the vision of chapter 7, you know that it projected four world empires. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Well, this vision is going to zoom in on the second and third empires of chapter 7. It's going to zoom in on the Medo-Persian and the Greek empires. Verse 2 As the vision progresses, Daniel says, hey, I see myself, I'm in Susa, the citadel. Susa was a city 220 miles east of Babylon. It was not an important city in Daniel's day, but it was going to be because it would be be one of the three capital cities of the Medo-Persian Empire. 
And so Daniel is there, and he says, I'm standing by the Ulai Canal, which was a man-made canal, massive, 900 feet wide. And there he stands, there he surveys this city, which one day will become very prominent, but not this day. And as he looks on, the vision picks up speed. Verse 3, a ram appears. But it's not an ordinary ram because you will see that it has two horns, one of which is larger than the other. But it's not just larger. As Daniel looks on, the second horn, which begins, it starts smaller, it grows and gets larger and larger until it's bigger than the first horn. That's unusual, and you should rightly ask, what does that mean? Well, later in Daniel chapter 8, verse 20, the angel's going to say, oh, well, the ram symbolizes the Medo-Persian Empire. And historically, the ram actually did represent the Medo-Persian Empire. The ancient historian, the Roman historian, Ammianus Marcellinus, he, and he said, you know, when a Persian ruler went to battle, they would carry a golden head of a ram with them. So God gets this detail exactly right. But now we have to answer the question, well, what about the two horns? And why are they different sizes? Well, there's a historical reason for that. The two horns represent the two divisions of the Medo-Persian Empire. First horn represents the Medes. Second horn represents the Persians. And the second is larger because the Persian sort of portion of the empire, starting with Cyrus, it assumed the dominance in the Medo-Persian empire. When Cyrus took control from then on, Persian kings dominated the leadership of the Medo-Persian empire. They had the most influence. Hence, the second horn representing Persia is bigger. Again, God nails the details. And verse 4 is remarkable because it maps out the future expansion of the Medo-Persian Empire. In verse 4, God charts the course of the Medo-Persian Empire. By the way, before we watch this course unfold, notice the word charging, right? That comes from a root word meaning to push, to gore, to thrust, right? And that's precisely how the Medo-Persian Empire expanded in the same directions given in verse 4. The Medo-Persian Empire pushed west. They conquered Babylon, Syria, and Asia Minor. And then they thrusted their way north, and they took over Armenia, and they butted their way south, and they captured Egypt and Ethiopia. And nobody could stand in the way of the Medo-Persian Empire. That's what the end of verse 4 implies. The ram, symbol for the Medo-Persian Empire, did as he pleased and became great. The Medo-Persian Empire was indeed great. At that point in time, it was the largest empire in history. Its territory was vast, its power unrivaled. And no doubt as Daniel is watching this ram and he's musing, what does it all mean? Well, he doesn't have time to formulate an answer because another animal appears. Verse five, first you have the ram, now you have a male goat. But just as the ram was unusual, so is this male goat. Male goats have two horns. This goat has one horn, and its temperament is ferociously aggressive. Look how it speeds across the ground. It collides with the ram with explosive force. Verse 7, the goat shatters the ram's horns, throws him to the ground, and tramples him to death with its sharp hooves. He obliterates the ram. Well, now would be a good time to pause and say, who is the male goat? What does it represent? Verse 21 offers the answer. Verse 21 says, well, the goat is the kingdom of Greece. And the single prominent horn, the conspicuous horn, well, that's its first king, the first king of the Grecian empire. Historians identify this man, Alexander the Great. Maybe you studied Alexander the Great in college or in high school, uh, but he's a fascinating character. Let me tell you a little bit about Alexander the Great, this conspicuous solitary horn. Well, he was born in 356 BC. His dad was the famous conqueror, Philip of Macedon. His mother, little side note here, interesting lady. Her name was Olympias. She was part of the cult of Dionysius. That was a snake-worshiping cult. It was said of Olympias that she slept with snakes in the bed. Yeah, you thought your parents were weird. 
Very strange household here. But nevertheless, Alexander came from Olympias and Philip. He was educated by Aristotle. The Aristotle was Alexander's tutor. Just 20 years of age, Alexander assumed the throne. He succeeded his father, Philip of Macedon. And history would prove that Alexander was a military genius and a battlefield tactician of unparalleled skill. So a year and a half after Alexander become king, becomes king, he marshals an army. And then he moves east to attack Medo-Persia. That's why verse 5 says, the, the, the goat comes from the west because Greece lay to the west of Medo-Persia. Again, you see the remarkable accuracy of God's predictive prophecy here. Verse 5 also shows how he moved without touching the ground. And it doesn't mean he floated, but what it is is language representing the extraordinary pace at which Alexander and his army of 35,000 men moved and the extreme rapidity with which they conquered the world. See, it took the Medo-Persians decades to conquer the world. Alexander did it in three years. Unbelievable speed. Verse 6, the male goat attacks the ram with powerful wrath. And that word wrath comes from a root verb that means to be hot. It implies rage and anger. And if you study history, well, that's exactly what the Greeks felt towards the Medo-Persians. There was long-standing tension between the two nations because Medo-Persia regularly uh, had these military incursions into Greece, and the Greeks never forgot nor forgave the sacking of Athens in 480 BC. So there was long-standing bitterness. So it is historically accurate that when Alexander and his forces engaged the Persians, they did it with violent strength and rage. And God nails this prophecy in verse 7. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. See, history, uh, there's one particular moment in history that really illustrates this dominating, decisive, and furious power and, and anger, really, of Alexander and his forces. Or it is 334 BC. We know it as the Battle of Granicus. Alexander and his army of 30, 35,000 men crossed the Granicus River and they engaged the larger Persian force. 100,000 foot soldiers on the Persian side, 10,000 horsemen, massive inequality in forces. The Greeks slaughter 20,000 Persians. The Greeks lose 100 men. That was typical of Alexander's battlefield genius and success. And there would be two more significant battles, one at Issus, one at Arbella, where Alexander would defeat massively superior Persian forces. One of them, he goes against an army of 600,000 men and wins. Well, those two subsequent victories irreversibly break the Persian backbone and the Persian kingdom languished before Alexander, Alexander swept it away. Verse eight, the goat became exceedingly great. The word exceedingly has the idea of excessive, beyond measure. And historically, that is totally true of the Greek, the Greek empire because Alexander's empire was vastly larger than even the Medo-Persian empire. Alexander's empire was the largest empire to date in history, 1.5 million square miles. It encompassed Greece, Asia Minor, Syria, Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, and Persia. And so when God said the goat became exceedingly great, the goat became exceedingly great in history as Alexander's empire became the largest land empire ever. But see, it wasn't just the empire that was enormous. It was actually Alexander's arrogance and ego. See, success, success after success and unbridled genius on the battlefield fueled massive pride. Alexander came to think of himself not as human, but as divine. He even ordered the provinces to worship him as a god. But his godhood did not last long. Verse 8, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken. The 
goat who conquered the world failed to conquer himself. June 323 BC, the tender age of 32, at the pinnacle of his power, the greatest man on earth, Alexander the Great, died unexpectedly in Babylon. Historians think it was a combination of exhaustion, wild partying, because he was a massive drinker, and severe fever. And in an instant, the greatest man on earth is snuffed out like a candle. But see, the end of his life did not spell the end for the Greek, Grecian Empire, nor the end of this vision. Back to verse 8. Yes, the great horn was broken in all of its strength, but... There came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Looking forward to verse 22 in chapter 8, tells us that the four conspicuous horns, those are four rulers who governed the four sectors of the, uh, the empire. So they, these four kingdoms sprouted out of the Greek empire. Let me explain what happened, historically speaking. Alexander died. He has a massive empire that someone must rule. Well, all of his generals wanted control. And so for 22 years, they fought one another for dominance. Finally, at long last, four generals remained, and they parceled out the empire in four pieces to those four generals. That's why the verse says the four winds of heaven, because the four cardinal directions is how they split up the empire. Cassander, he took the west, Macedonia and Greece. Lysimachus, another general, he took the north, Thrace, Bithynia, Asia Minor. Another general, Seleucus, he took the eastern portion, Syria and Babylonia. And then Ptolemy, perhaps you know the Ptolemaic dynasty from history, well, he took the south, Egypt, Israel, and Arabia. But as you note in this vision, Daniel's gaze doesn't linger long on these men because a new player quickly emerges. Verse 9. Out of one of them, meaning out of one of those four horns, one of the four kingdoms, came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And I want to think for a moment about the little horn. Well, if you were here last week, you heard Pastor Todd preach on chapter 7, and you know there was a little horn there too. And maybe you say, ah, same guy, not the same guy. This, the little horn of chapter 7 came out of the fourth empire. You might call it the revived Roman Empire. This guy, this little horn, comes out of the Greek Empire. So it's not the same man, although, as we will see later, there is definitely a relationship or correspondence between the two. But for now, what I want to do is I want to explore who is this little horn of chapter 8? Well, historians are almost unanimous in identifying this man as Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He was the eighth ruler of the Seleucid dynasty. Uh, if you remember, Seleucus, one of the generals, he took one of the quadrants, the Syrian sector of the Greek empire. Well, Antiochus came from that section. That's why the little horn grew out of one of the other four horns. Antiochus IV Epiphanes, he ruled from 175 to 163 BC. That's about 400 years into the future from where Daniel is, by the way. So when you watch this unfold with startling accuracy, just remember God gave this to Daniel 400 years before. Well, Antiochus is called a little horn. And that tells you something about him. The word little there means little with the idea of insignificant because he came from humble beginnings. And that detail is factually true because historians will say, hey, Antiochus wasn't supposed to be the king. He was not the rightful heir to the throne. Although, you know, he was in the Syrian sector. Yeah, he lived most of his childhood in Rome. He was a hostage to the Roman Empire. The, a man by the name of Demetrius was supposed to assume the throne in uh, the Seleucid dynasty. However, Demetrius was traded to Rome as a hostage. Antiochus got free. And so while uh, the rightful heir was gone, Antiochus swooped in. Through a combination of intrigue, flattery, and bribery, he seized power. That's why it says he, had, he was a little horn, because he had an unexpected, insignificant beginning. But he didn't end that way. Verse 9, he grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. 
And you're going to see again the immaculate, accurate precision of God's prophecy here because that movement of his greatness is exactly parallel to what happened with Antiochus's empire. He expanded the kingdom south by conquering Egypt. He expanded east by conquering Persia, Parthia, and Armenia. And he expanded the empire towards what the text calls the glorious land. That's Palestine. That's where the Jews lived. And the description of Antiochus continues in verse 10. You'll note that it, he, he goes against the stars and the host of heavens and he throws them to the ground and he tramples all over them. Well, you might say that's a bit baffling. What, what does that mean? Well, that's figurative language to describe the massive persecution that Antiochus would unleash against the Jews. He was the vilest, cruelest tyrant to ever govern the Jews, and it showed. Let me give you just one example of the many acts of horror which Antiochus perpetrated against the Jews. It's 169 BC. Antiochus goes on a military excursion to Egypt. He's repulsed by the Romans. They say, turn back or Rome will attack you. So like a dog with his tail between his legs, he patters off, but he's angry. So he passes through Israel. He slaughters 40,000 men, women, children, and infants. Yes, babies. And then he takes 40,000 more and he sells them to get rich. But that was just one of the many things that Antiochus would do against the Jews. Verse 10 says, he became great, even as great as the prince of hosts. Prince of the host is a reference to God. What that tells you is Antiochus challenged God, raised himself up against God as if he were God. And history precisely confirms this. He's called Antiochus Epiphanes, right? Antiochus is a name. Epiphanes is a title. Epiphanes is a title that he applied to himself. What it means is illustrious manifestation, which means he claimed to be the representative of the gods. Now, funny enough, the Jews hated him, so they didn't call him Epiphanes. They called him Epimenes, which means madman. And he was. He also had gold, or actually he had coins minted, and the coins said this, Theos Epiphanes, which means God manifest. And he was talking about himself. So he was pompous beyond, uh, beyond belief. So he definitely exalted himself against the God of heaven, but he also waged an all-out campaign to eradicate and stamp out Judaism. He hated God, and he hated God's people and God's religion. Verse 11, he took away the regular burnt offering. That's not just commentary. Uh, that really happened. 167 BC, Antiochus forbade the Jews from offering the, the regular continual sacrifices to Yahweh, to God, in the Jewish temple. And then he banned sacrifices to God, and he said, you must sacrifice to the, the Greek gods, because he was trying to promote Hellenism. He hated Judaism. He was trying to promote the worship of the Greek gods. So he said, you can't observe the Sabbath. You can't observe your holy days, and you can't be circumcised, which, of course, was uh, extraordinarily important for the Jewish people. But he didn't just say, hey, no circumcision. This is what he did. He outlawed circumcision. And then he said, go and find every circumcised baby and kill them. And then take the dead baby, drape it around the mom's neck and kill her. And then find the husband who allowed this to happen and killed him. And then find the man who circumcised the baby and kill him. Because Antiochus hated God and God's religion and God's people. But that actually wasn't the extent of the house of horrors of Antiochus. No, verse 11 adds, the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. That's a reference to the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. What it doesn't mean is it doesn't mean that Antiochus bulldozed the temple and just raised it to the ground. No, he didn't demolish the literal physical structure, but what he did was defile and desecrate it. Let me tell you how he did that. 169 BC, Antiochus goes to the temple and he just plunders it. He steals everything of value in the temple, every golden object, every golden utensil, all the golden furniture, anything of value, all the treasures in the temple, he steals and he takes back with him to enrich himself. 
but he does even more to defile the temple. See, two years later, he commits the ultimate abomination. Two years later, he erects a pagan altar to Zeus. And then he sacrifices a pig, a swine on on this altar in the temple. And then he takes the swine's blood and he sprinkles it all over the temple. And then he makes the high priest eat the pig, which if you know anything about Judaism, that would be the most unthinkable act of cruelty imaginable. And Antiochus went further. Verse 12 says he also threw truth to the ground. It's referring to God's truth. And the way that Antiochus continued his assault against heaven and against the Jewish people is Antiochus outlawed the Torah, which would be the Jewish scriptures. Antiochus said, every copy of the Torah that you find must be shredded and burned. And everyone who possesses a copy must be immediately executed. Antiochus was an evil, evil man. And although Daniel did not understand all of this because this was 400 years into the future, no doubt it was disturbing to him. And it also disturbed, verse 13, the angels who were observing. Uh, They actually interrupt these holy ones, these angels. And, And one of them is so disturbed, he interrupts and he says, he asks, for how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, that is the sacrifices, the transgression that makes death desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? In other words, how long is God going to let Epimenes the madman trample God's people. Well, the reply comes from the lips of another angel, verse 14. 2,300 evenings and mornings. And it's a bit difficult to pinpoint exactly what that means because there are two quite viable options. One is 2,300 evening evenings and mornings, um, which that refers to sacrifices, evening and mornings. And so they say, hey, there were sacrifices in the morning, sacrifices at night, 2,300 to a day. That gives you 1,150 days. Well, that would be a period of a little bit more than three years, which corresponds to the total length of time that Antiochus desecrated the Jewish temple. Others, however, would say, no, 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 evenings and mornings is a unit. It's not separate, it's a unit. So that gives you 2,300 days. 2,300 days works out to about six years and four months, give or take. And that corresponds very well to the overall period of time that Antiochus actually oppressed the Jews in history. Either way, the termination of the 2,300 evenings and mornings is definitive. That would be December 164 B.C., Some even say December 25. What happened on December 25 or December 164 BC? Well, let me help you with that. That's when Judas Maccabeus led a Jewish revolt, overthrew Antiochus's rule, and then they reconsecrated the temple, took it back, rededicated it, cleansed it so that they could install or reinstate the Jewish sacrifices. That's why Jews celebrate Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights, to commemorate this moment. Verse 15, Daniel's head is spinning. He is not comprehending all that this means. And God understands that. That's why God sends, he dispatches an ambassador. uh, Verse 16, an angel by the name of Gabriel. By the way, first time in the Bible, an angel gets a name. But you're going to see Gabriel again in the New Testament because he makes some more appearances. But for now, Gabriel, whose name means the mighty one, Gabriel is dispatched to give insight to Daniel. Look at the end of verse 17. What Daniel really needs to know is that the vision is for the time of the end. And so here's where things get uh, become really, really important that you follow the logic. So I need you to track with me very carefully here. The vision is for the time of the end. This is critical to the overall import of this chapter. The phrase, the time of the end, that comes four more times in the Old Testament. All of those occurrences are in Daniel. Daniel 11.35, 11.40, 12.4, and 12.9. And every one of those four occurrences happens within the context of the Antichrist, within the period of the Antichrist. 
which would suggest, but not prove, that this vision isn't simply a picture of what Antiochus will do, but also a picture of what will happen under the Antichrist. But things get more intriguing when you get to verse 19. Verse 19, look at what Gabriel says. Behold, I will make known to you, speaking to Daniel, what <clears throat> shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. Remember, Gabriel comes to give Daniel clarity. This statement and what follows is intended to sharpen his picture of what the vision means. Let me help you with that. Gabriel says, or he, he, we're gonna, I'm going to show you that this vision is not exclusively for the days of Antiochus. Although it definitely does describe what will happen under Antiochus, the phrase at the latter end of the indignation, that is a specific reference to the wrath which will be unleashed by Antiochus against the Jews, the persecution. But that is not the extent of what that phrase means. The word indignation is going to appear again in Daniel 11.36. The context of Daniel 11.36 is the time of the Antichrist. Now let me connect another dot for you. The end of Gabriel's statement in verse 19, he says the appointed time of the end. That exact phrase, the appointed time of the end. If you keep reading Daniel, you'll see it two more times. Daniel 11, 27, Daniel 11, 35. And guess what the context is? It's the time of the Antichrist. So what is happening here as Gabriel says, Daniel, let me give you clarity about what you just saw. What he is communicating is Everything which you saw and which he's about to explain in 23 to 25 is true of Antiochus, the fourth Epiphanes. This will come to pass under him. But everything that comes to pass under Antiochus is it prefigures or foreshadows or anticipates what is going to happen when the Antichrist, not an Antichrist, the Antichrist appears, the little horn of chapter 7. Let me say that again, because this is absolutely critical for understanding. Gabriel is telling Daniel, your vision will predict what happens when Antiochus comes. It will also foreshadow what happens when the Antichrist comes. Got it? It's going to be true of Antiochus Epiphanes. And it's going to be true of the Antichrist when he comes. By the way, that has not happened. We are not living in those days. That is still future, but we know what it'll look like. So with that in mind, let me give you further clarity. We're going to jump to verses 23 to 25. So we've already basically covered 20 to 22 because it just says, here's who the ram is, here's who the goat is. We know that. But we're more interested in verses 23 to 25 because Gabriel is going to elaborate on this little horn, namely Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And remember, everything that is true of Antiochus IV Epiphanes prefigures, anticipates the Antichrist, which would be the little horn of chapter 7. So remember I said there's correspondence between the two? Yeah, uh, Antiochus is a type of the Antichrist to come. And let me give you nine parallels that illuminate this connection between the little horn here and the little horn of seven. You're not going to be able to write them all down because I don't have time for that, but I just want you to soak it up. Nine parallels between the little horns from verses 23, 24, and 25. Number one, Antiochus is said to have a bold face, verse 23. That means he's going to have a merciless, um, ruthless demeanor. Well, Antichrist in Daniel 7.20 has an imposing appearance. Number two, Antiochus is going to understand riddles, verse 23. That means he's going to be skilled in political intrigue and a master, master problem solver with kingdom issues. Antichrist is shown as having eyes in Daniel 7.20, and horns don't have eyes. Well, the import there is 
communicates he's going to have shrewd brilliance. Number three, Antiochus, according to verse 24, has great power, and he will have great power. But the Antichrist will have even more power, according to 2 Thessalonians 2.9. Number four, Antiochus would prosper. He would succeed, but not by his own power, verse 24. Well, Antichrist will succeed and prosper, but not by his own power, because he will literally be energized by Satan himself. That is Revelation 13.2. Number five, Antiochus will persecute the saints. That's verse 24. Antichrist will persecute the saints, Revelation 13, 7. Number six, Antiochus is going to prosper for a limited season. That's verse 25. Antichrist will prosper for a limited season, Revelation 17, 12. Number seven, Antiochus was a liar, and it says, verse 25, he shall make deceit prosper. Well, the world's greatest deceiver ever is the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians 2.9. Number eight, Antiochus opposed God, who was called the Prince of Princes in verse 25. Well, the Antichrist is going to oppose God and Jesus, Revelation 13.5. Number nine, Antiochus, according to verse 25, was broken, but by no human hand. And what that means is he's not going to die at the hands of an assassin or a man. And history validates that. In fact, the Greek historian Polybius, he says, actually, Antiochus died because he was fearfully tormented and actually went insane. Now, others will say, uh, you know, he died of remorse and grief after he suffered a crushing military defeat. Either way, he didn't die at the hands of a man. That will be true of Antichrist, who, according to Revelation 19, 20, will be cast alive into hell by God, not by a man. Well, Daniel did not understand all of these connections. And we know that, verse 27, the very end says, I was appalled by the vision. He knew it portended dark things. He just did not know exactly what dark things He said, I was appalled and I did not understand it. Interestingly enough, that word overcome, Daniel was overcome. It literally means I I was done. I was finished. I'm just, this thing wiped me out. That's why he was sick for days. But you know what? Despite that, Daniel was faithful, verse 26, to seal up the vision, which doesn't mean hide it and keep it secret. Um, Sealing is what they would do with ancient documents to preserve it. So Daniel faithfully preserved the message, which is why you and I can read it. That's what the vision means. That's question number one. What does it mean? Well, we know what it means now. Now let's look at the second question before we conclude and answer, what do I do? What do I do? I mean, I'm not a Jew. I'm not living under the shadow of a dark foreign oppressor. How does this apply to me? Another way to think about it would be to say, what key principles or insights can I extract from this text and deploy in my own life so that I personally may be prepared to trust God no matter what happens in the future? Well, let me help you there. I'm going to give you three, three key principles that will prepare you. Number one, God rules the world. And I know that sounds basic. And you might say, man, that's repetitive. I think you've told me that every time you've preached in Daniel. Because God tells you that every chapter of Daniel, he wants you to know that God alone rules the world. History is not determined by local, state, or national elections. History is not determined by political parties or charismatic leaders or military masters. History is not determined by men like Alexander the Great or Antiochus IV Epiphanes. History is determined by God because God rules the world. Not kings, not governors, not emperors, not presidents, not congresses. World leaders serve at God's behest. And when he is done with them, When they have served his secret sovereign agenda, when they have advanced his plan and purpose, then he sweeps them aside and he installs his next ruler. Does that mean they worship him? Of course not. But they do serve him unwittingly. 
and they advance His agenda. That's why I say God rules the world. And even though Alexander the Great wanted to be worshipped as a god and build an empire for his own great name, he really just served God. Same with Antiochus Epiphanes. So personal implication for you, if you are tempted to fret about the future of our country, or more personally, the future of your marriage, or your children's spiritual future, or your career, or your health, then Daniel would say, just relax. God is on the throne. God rules the world, and he knows what he's doing. Key principle number two. We start with God rules the world. Number two, expect opposition from the world. History validates the single voice of the Bible, which unanimously affirms God's people will be opposed. God's people will be targeted. God's people will be oppressed. God's people will even be killed. And all you have to do is look in the history books to see that play out over and over and over again. There's a reason Jesus told his disciples, John 15, 20, remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Those were not mere words. That was fact and truth. And his disciples, by the way, as they were killed in various parts of the world, came to realize that was true. And it has been true for generations of believers. And I totally get, none of you want to be persecuted. None of you want to be oppressed or marginalized. You'd be insane to desire that. But you must recognize recognize the sober reality that our world is increasingly hostile to both Jesus and his people. And if you are one of his people, you will be targeted. Now, that's going to look differently for each one of you based on who you are, where you are, and when you are. It might just look like old friends no longer want you around because you're saved. It might look like you're passed over for promotion because you hold to biblical values. You might even get fired because you will not get on board with your company's LGBTQ plus agenda. It might even look like you preach Christ on the street somewhere at Mill Avenue evangelizing and the police arrest you and label you as a hate speech giver and then they put you in prison because you're anti-Semitic. That's not hard to imagine that coming true. There are already laws proposed that would do that. So what I'm saying is expect opposition. And when opposition comes, anchor yourself in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, where Peter reminds his listeners, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Third principle, we start with God rules the world. We move to expect opposition from the world. We end with your home is not this world. And I know you've heard that and maybe you have it stitched on a needle point in your kitchen and you say, yeah, of course the world's not my home. But I think we often forget that in practice. Because after all, after all, all we know is this world. And so it's easy to think, well, maybe I'm really not passing through, like Scripture says, just a sojourner. Maybe this is it. Maybe maybe my career is everything. My family is everything. My financial future is everything. My, you know, advancing pickleball career in the Mecca of Gilbert. That's everything. But here's what happens when this world becomes your home. You look out at what's happening in the world and you get disillusioned because what you find is a whole lot of pain and problems and sadness and madness and corruption and oppression and inequality and injustice. And you say, 
This is a pretty bad place. And you get disheartened because you forget this is not your home. You have a home. It's heaven. If you're a Christian, your home lies above. It is in heaven. And so we need to remember the words of Jesus in John 14 to his disciples. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, get this, you may be also. Amen. Isn't that good news for us? The point of this passage is to prepare Premonitus, premonitus. Forewarned is forearmed. This text has forewarned us. But more than that, it has reminded us in whom we must place our faith. The God who rules history. No matter what the world stage or the news page displays, God rules history. And incidentally, he's meant to rule your hearts too. Which means God intends that each and every one of you would humble yourself, turn from your sins, repent of your sins, and submit to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He doesn't merely control the world. He's meant to control your heart. We're meant to respond with willing obedience. And so I would appeal to you, if you hear this chapter and you know that you do not follow the God of Daniel 8, today is the day for you to submit to the King of heaven. He rules the world. He's meant to rule your heart too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the incredibly, immaculately, accurately precise prophecy of Daniel 8 and the confidence it gives us in the Bible that we can trust the word of God because we can trust the God of the word, the God who gave us these words, the God who orchestrates history. And Lord, I do ask that we would Brace ourselves for whatever dark days are ahead. And we would remember that you rule and you are good. And our home awaits. Jesus beckons. And when our days are done, we will join him forever. Let us not be discouraged along the way, Father. Let us not lose heart. Let us remember that you write history and we can trust you with the pen. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in to our Redeemer YouTube channel. If this is helpful for you, please make sure that you like this video, smash the subscribe button, and hit that bell icon. It will help us reach more people with biblical truth. Thank you so much.